Well, as many of you probably know Canadians, and maybe you didn't know I'm a Canadian, but I was born in Vancouver, I hate to admit, 1951. Same year as Jan Kind, who was the Theosophy Forward magazine editor. Uh, but as my wife, rest her soul, used to say, there were no real women in Canada, so I had to go to Britain to find my angel, which I did. <laughs> and, uh, but I've been a member of the society, as uh, my compatriot in crime suggests. It'll be actually, I think I probably joined about the 17th November in the year 1969. Um, he also uh, flatters me by suggesting I'm a serious student. I had to do two jobs to earn my whack to support three stepchildren. So I have been, I think they call it Dharma yoga. I was giving service to the family and to the society. But I did give lectures back in the 80s, but once I got married at 1990, I'm afraid that was shelved for a while. And then I lost my wife 10 years ago and I've started to come back as a lecturer. So if this is too lightweight, don't worry. I'll try and make it amusing and entertaining. So. Let the show go on. Now, Theosophy, the Utopian Ideal. This talk was initially given at the Summer School of the Theosophical Society in England in the year 2012 on the occasion of the Olympics being held in London. So you might say that the theme of the school then had a rather athletic curve on spirituality and all that that entails. A lot of spiritual organizations perhaps saw the opportunity to draw a link between sports and the pursuit of excellence in every department of life. The Unitarian magazine in Britain, The Enquirer, is one such organ that saw useful possibilities in this direction. They ran an article, Olympic Spirit Once Met Faith, in their July 2012 number. And we were told that the French Baron Pierre de Coupertin who resurrected the Olympics in the year 1896, when the modern TS was just 19 years young, wanting the modern incarnation to mirror the ancient games, which were first held in the year 776 BC. And the theme for the ancient games was to inspire youth to develop physical and spiritual excellence. The modern games do differ from their ancient counterpart. Women then were not allowed to participate in the Olympiads in days gone by. What a contrast to the 2012 Olympics in London where each of the 200 nations taking part had female athletes, a number of which included the Middle East. There were no medals presented in days of old, only a wreath and greenery for the victor's head. What would British athletes make of such awards of the past when just the previous week to the Olympiad, in an article, there was the remark that the only medal worth having was one of gold. Fortunately, not all Olympians of today share the same view. Herb Elliott, an Australian middle distance runner, had said, it is the inspiration of the modern Olympic Games that drives people to not only to compete, but to improve and to bring lasting moral and spiritual benefits to the athlete and an inspiration to those fortunate enough to witness the athletic dedication. A flame did burn at the ancient site of Olympia, but unlike its modern counterpart in London's East End, it was a religious symbol placed on the head of the goddess Hera a novel feature of the ancient games was the truce enacted between warring states, somewhat mirrored on that fateful Yuletide evening in the first year of World War I, when German and British soldiers put down their arms and took part in a football match. This allowed athletes to travel to and from Olympia in safety. Contrast that with the modern games, which had been cancelled three times in the 20th century because of war. And in 1972, athletes were actually attacked by terrorists. In fact, much more than just sport, the ancient games included a lot of cultural events with competitions for poetry and music. Interestingly enough, the latest games, after a lull of many years, have revived this feature, albeit in a non-competitive form, but primarily the ancient games were religious in their makeup. 
There are many references to the Greek Olympics in the Christian Bible. In Ecclesiastes 9.11 we read, Swiftness does not win the race, nor strength the battle. This is another way of saying more than just winning the race is required, that excellent depends on acquisition of something greater. The passage continues, Surely wisdom is better than strength. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. Elsewhere in the Bible, St. Paul tells his disciple Timothy, You heard my teaching. Hang on that teaching. No athlete wins a prize unless he abides by the rules. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul uses the metaphor of the games more extensively. At the games, as you know, all the runners take part, though only one wins the prize. You must also run to win. For Paul, this was more than just coming first in a race. It was about receiving a spiritual gold, not in competition with other people, but in competition with oneself, and this involves spiritual self-discipline. Just as the athlete's victory at the games involves physical self-discipline, Paul continues, every athlete goes into strict training. They do it to win a fading garland, we to win a garland that never fades. For Paul and the Christians, he was addressing the games with a spiritual message, a message about balance and wholeness, about honing one's own being to a state of personal excellence winning not an Olympic gold medal, but spiritual fulfillment. The theme for the 2012 English school was the Olympian vision, and my own small contribution was to explore the importance of embracing a unitary philosophy in making this vision a living reality. I quote from Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, one of the co-founders of this great organization in Collected Writings 10, page 163, where she says, Theosophy is not a religion, we say, but religion itself. The one bond of unity, which is so universal and all-embracing, so that no man has no speck from gods and mortal down to animals, a blade of grass or an atom can be outside of its light. Therefore, any organization or body of that name must necessarily be a universal brotherhood. Were it otherwise, theosophy would be but a word added to hundreds of other words, as high-sounding as they are, pretentious and empty. Viewed as a philosophy, theosophy in its practical work is the alembic of the medieval alchemist. It transmutes the apparently base metal of every ritualistic and dogmatic creed into the gold of fact and truth, and thus truly produces a universal panacea for the ills of mankind. The famous English writer John Donne coined the expression, no man is an island, that everything is linked by what in the modern idiom is described as the web of life. Many in the United Kingdom have always felt somewhat apart from their brethren on the European continent, and this could not be more true now in the year 2019, what with all the Brexit chaos, as it was when this lecture was first aired some seven years earlier. And even in spite of building of the Channel Tunnel nearly 30 years ago, some on the wrong side of the year 70 still harbour feelings of separation. Fortunately, most of the youth of Britain do not feel that Europe is somewhere else. H. P. Blavatsky spells out this underlying oneness of life in even more graphic terms in her magnum opus, 
the secret doctrine. Now we'll stop there. The radical unity of the ultimate essence. Well, we've got a bit of a laugh there, at least. <laughs> the radical unity of the ultimate essence of each constituent part of compounds in nature, from star to mineral atom, from the highest Diani Chohan to the smallest infusoria, in the fullest acceptation of the term and whether applied to the physical, intellectual, or spiritual worlds, this is the one fundamental law in occult science. The Rig Veda, one of the oldest scriptures in the world, tells us that the one life is recognized as transcending all human categories and hence is designated by such impersonal terms as it or that. The scripture declares that other than it, there nothing has since been. Get your head around that, I say. Where once the significance of this fundamental principle is grasped, namely that all things are but the one, appearing under limitations of time and form, certain other principles, corollaries as it were, become self-evident, which is something very true to all Americans, because in your constitution are the words, these truths are self-evident. There must have been some magicians of the ancient philosophy involved in writing of that. Here are some of those basic concepts. There is no ultimate duality in nature. No ultimate distinction between spirit and matter. No ultimate separation of any unit from the whole. For all things in the essence of their beings are the original one as the indwelling life in all things is one only, the spirit in man is identical with the universal spirit, hence the affirmation, that are thou. There is no dead matter, no empty space, for life is everywhere. Every atom, every molecule, every entity, both visible and invisible, physical and non-physical, Life is quite literally omnipresent, and this one life is indestructible, without beginning or end. Only the multitude of forms through which it finds expression are subject to birth and death and change. They are temporary, passing appearances. The forms perish, but the life is imperishable. Once we embrace the ideal of the one life flowing through everything, it is one short step to acceptance of the proposition that every man is my brother and every woman is my sister. Such an attitude invests in us a responsibility for every other human and all life forms on the planet. And by ill treatment of others, we are ultimately hurting our own selves. Genetic engineering has been a bete noir for me for a very long time, and I hope you don't all empty the house after I start to talk a bit about it, because I think this is a very topical subject that all of us need to bring our best ideas to. This concern for me manifests in the sphere of genetic engineering, sorry, this concern for me manifests in the sphere of genetic engineering where we all stand to be potentially winners or losers. I ask, can you imagine a world where you know from your birth your chances of developing cancer or other diseases, and your personal health profile is kept not in a doctor's filing cabinet, but on a plastic smart card? This brave new world of medicine could be reality in just a decade's time it was suggested in Britain's Daily Mail newspaper a few years back. Health experts at the European Cancer Conference in Vienna in the past say that advances in genetic profiling could help prevent cancer and transform treatments. Doctors have already identified genes responsible for some common forms of lung, breast, bowel and prostate cancer. And parents identified as having a risk of certain diseases would receive lifestyle advice and treatment to suit their own genetic profile. 
Recent discoveries emanating from the Human Genome Project, a joint British-American enterprise, have traced many of the 2,000 genes responsible for health, providing scope for a massive advance in millennial medicine. And it is thought that further work will pinpoint genes in other conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, and high blood pressure. Doctors could use this information to tell patients of illnesses of which they're particularly at risk and help them avoid diseases from an earlier age. In an article in Britain's Sunday Times by John Kerry, no relation to the American congressman, talking about utopias, we read the following. The promise that genetic engineering holds out for improving the race represents the most significant utopian advance since nuclear fission. And now, again, there she is. The 23rd of February, 1997, was a red letter date in scientific circles, for on that date was announced news of Dolly, the first animal cloned from a single cell taken from an adult sheep. And from that day, the near universal fear of genetic engineering increased tenfold. Now, the creation of Dolly did not actually involve genetic engineering, but it was the driving force behind research which led to her production. The cloning process itself was the same used to create the first tadpole at Oxford in 1968. But what was different about Dolly is that she was the first mammal to be cloned. The question, of course, is, if sheep today, why not humans tomorrow? Now, since Dolly, there have been further developments. In the 1990s, a sheep with human genes was cloned. Mice cloned from other mice followed. And the South Koreans, not to be outdone, it isn't just Samsung they're noted for, in the last decade they claim to have cloned and then destroyed the world's first human embryo. And pressure is being applied to try and persuade the UK judiciary to legalize cloning in the very near future. Again, Britain's Daily Mail newspaper a few years ago ran a headline, Is cloning for spare part surgery only a few years away? Now, using the same technology as produced Dolly, the first cloned human embryo would be used as a source of unlimited bone marrow and blood for a child with leukemia. And one day, patients would be able to have their body parts cloned for use in emergency transplants. Genetically engineered mice and farm animals have been around for many years and used for everything from basic research to attempts to create humanized animal organs for transplant. Any changes that are present in the animal's sperm or eggs, the germ cells, so as it's called, will be passed on to succeeding generations. What is a bonus in agricultural biotechnology is for many the most worrying thing about genetic engineering in humans. Large-scale genetic engineering could also rob society of desirable traits. What if the, gene the disease genes, in combination with other genes or in people who are merely a carriers, also produce such intangibles as artistic creativity, razor-sharp wit, or the talent that we see at the Olympics? Wipe out the gene, and you risk losing those traits as well. Leif Cavalieri, a molecular biologist, biologist at the State University of New York, says, the potential power of genetic engineering is far greater than that of splitting the atom, and it could be ever, every bit as dangerous to society. While genetic engineering for health purposes might seem a bit like science fiction to most of us, the matter of GM foods is pretty much an everyday concern. Knowingly or unknowingly, on this side of the pond or on the other side of the pond, most of us have already eaten genetically modified food in the form of tomato puree, vegetarian cheese, and soya products. Genetic manipulation has been presented as a key to feeding the world without destroying the environment and biotechnology companies promote their products as safe, healthy, and environmentally friendly. They claim that genetic modification could feed the world, 
through development of crops which will tolerate drought, saline soils, or frosts, and thus increase food production in marginal areas. The company Monsanto, now owned by the German pharma company Bayer, has made huge investments to build a factory producing the herbicide Roundup in Brazil. And the Brazilian government had approved this resistant soya bean as the country's first GM product earlier in this century. The soya will benefit the big landowners who will feed it to their cattle for export, rather than the majority of subsistence farmers who may well go to the wall. We have to ask ourselves in these instances, where is the compassion in all of this? Farmers in your great country are able to grow a rapeseed plant, which has been altered to produce tropical type oils on which the economies of the Philippines and Indonesia depend. Another example of big rules, okay mate, as they may well put it in the United Kingdom, at the price of the small man. One of the most vociferous of the critics has come from a holistic biologist, Mei Huan Wo of the University, Open University in the UK. In a book entitled Genetic Engineering, Dream or Nightmare, Dr. Ho, who died earlier this year, calls for the rejection of gene technology in the way that the public opposed nuclear energy in earlier decades because of the risk of accidents and the problems of disposing of radioactive waste. Using the Cold War imagery of a nuclear winter, Ho predicts that if biotechnology continues along its present course, a critical genetic meltdown will occur, bringing about the end of humanity as we know it. She claims that genetic engineering is the only way to, or rather she dismisses claims that genetic engineering is the only way to feed the world's growing population. The fact that we actually now produce enough food for 8 billion people when the population is about seven and a quarter suggests that we already are managing to produce enough food. We don't need to produce more for the current population. And we haven't even harvested the oceans, which was something 50 years ago was thought something we needed to do to keep up with food shortages. In fact, a recent report, as I say, suggests we're already more than feeding enough of the people's food on this planet. And even more efficient methods of agriculture could stretch this figure even higher without having to resort to harvesting the oceans, which had been suggested at least 25 years ago as a way to stave off food shortages. She says we have in the developing world the only model for agriculture that remains viable for hundreds of years rather than for just a decade. Ho says that gene technology is driven by a mindset that recognizes no moral values. It is contrary to scientific evidence, it doesn't work the way it claims, and it's oblivious of the grave dangers posed by the technologies. She says it's bad science working hand in hand with big business corporations under the banner of free trade and free choice. It will effectively take control of every aspect of our lives from food production to reproduction. And in the process, it may ruin our food supply, destroy biodiversity, and unleash pandemics of drug and antibiotic infectious diseases. One of the greatest critics of the reductionist view put forth by these people is Lynn Margulis, who was a professor of biology at Massachusetts University and co-author with this chap who you've seen before, British biologist James Lovelock of the Gaia Hypothesis, which regards the entire planet as alive. Margulis argues that the mechanistic view of life is misdirected, incorrect, or at the very minimum, grossly inadequate. Her own tendency is towards dynamic, interactive, physiological thinking, what might be described as the Gaian alternative. This viewpoint, when applied to genetics, emphasizes relationships, networks, and patterns of which genes are only a part, and regards DNA as subservient to organisms and ecosystems as wholes. In place of neo-Darwinism and genetic determination, Gaians offer vitalism 
as a way to understand the workings of organisms. The theory which achieved a considerable following in the 1920s, and it postulates that living things contain some force field, substance or entity that is not present in non-living matter. Now, here's a good friend of mine that I'm sure you've all have heard of, Rupert Sheldrake. The 1980s is when he claimed to fame with a book that was doomed prime for burning. He may as well have been called Martin Luther. A British cell biologist who's actually the media darling who talks all about psychic pets, which I'm sure you've probably seen on television from time to time. And remote viewing is another subject he covers, that you actually, people know that you're looking at them. I mean, if that's not occultism, tell me what it is. Anyway, back in the 80s, he was the guest speaker at the English Summer School talking about a new science of life. And in that, he advanced a new vitalistic theory called formative causation that appeals to morphogenetic fields as an explanation for the complexities and regularities. Morphogenetic fields, in Sheldrake's views, are non-material, Probably probability structures consisting of direct connections across space and time between similar entities and governing the form and behavior of everything from simple molecules to entire communities of complex living beings. Living system theorists like Fritjof Capra sometimes adopt spiritual terms to portray the ecological interconnectedness of living things. Capra writes, when the concept of the human spirit is understood as the mode of consciousness in which the individual feels a sense of belonging, of connectiveness to the cosmos as a whole, it becomes clear that ecological awareness is spiritual in its deepest essence. It is therefore not surprising that the emerging new vision of reality based on deep ecological awareness is consistent with the so-called perennial philosophy of spiritual traditions, in other words, theosophy. Whether we talk about the spirituality of Christian mystics, that of Buddhists, or the philosophy and cosmology underlying the Native American traditions. Most Gaians believe that something else that is missing from the reductionist descriptions of nature impinges on the physical world via living things and is subjectively experienced by each living organism as its self. The intuition, perception, or belief that other beings have a self with an interior experience comparable to one's own is the basis for ethics or altruism. When we feel compassion or love for another being or another thing, our inner self reaches out to that of the other and its, in, its interests become ours. The Gaian view also recognizes that no individual self can exist apart from the web of life. There's John Donne again. All beings are interdependent. In the subject before us today, motive is a crucial element, and what sort of future effects will ensue from the actions of the perpetrators of genetic engineering? As one of the real founders of the Theosophical Movement says in the Mahatma Letters, Well, my dear sirs, always judge men by their motives and the moral effects of their motions. For the world's false standards, we have no respect. The matter of motive appears in an article of the World Goodwill Newsletter of October 1997, entitled Genetics and the Balance of Nature. And we read, perhaps the only way to judge such a difficult matter is to seek out the true motive and purpose of the specific genetic alteration and see whether it is consonant with the highest principles of which hearts do intuitively, intuitively resonate. One factor which a number of projects have in common is the concern for human health. Sheep have been engineered to produce a human protein in their milk, which may be used to treat cystic fibrosis. 
and human genes have been inserted into pigs in order to make their organs more suitable for transplantation into humans. Another factor which many projects have in common is the improvement in plant and animal varieties which may help to alleviate human hunger. Because the main purpose of these projects is to benefit mankind, they reinforce the assumption that only human beings are of major value and that all other forms of life can be subordinated to human ends. This is a view that a growing number of persons, and not just in the Theosophical Society, are questioning, proposing that every creature in the great web of life is intrinsically valuable. And if we accept this premise, then every relationship which humans enter into with other creatures should be categorized by good will. At the very least, says the magazine, we should call for national and international regulatory processes to govern genetic engineering experiments. The following statement from The Secret Doctrine, volume 2, page 349, should demonstrate that there is nothing new under the sun, including in the field of science. Blavatsky says, when we are told that inorganic matters are produced in the laboratory by what may literally be called artificial evolution, we answer that alchemists and adepts have done as much, indeed, and indeed far more, before the chemists ever attempted to, quote, build a disassociated element's complex combinations. The homunculi of Paracelsus are in fact in alchemy and will become one in chemistry very likely. And then Mrs. Shelley's Frankenstein will have to be regarded as a prophecy. But no chemist or alchemist will ever endow such a Frankenstein monster with more than animal instinct. And accounts from the book of Jean indicate the existence in the last days of Atlantis of artificially made beasts similar way in ways to Frankenstein's creation, which spoke and warned its master of every approaching danger. Blavatsky says the master was a black magician and that the mechanical animal was informed by a genii, an elemental, according to the accounts. The blood of a pure man alone could destroy it. Now, it's possible that the New Spirituality, a trans-denominational movement that includes the so-called New Age movement, may provide a more promising avenue for moral evaluation of biotech than traditional religions could do. While seeking to avoid religious dogmatism, proponents of this spirituality at the same time honor the innate human longing for meaning and for connection with some great overarching pattern or force that transcends the purely material aspects of existence. If this spirituality movement could said to have a core of universally agreed tenets, that core might be the perennial philosophy, a phrase coined by Leibniz and used by Aldous Huxley. Lovely cat there, isn't it? As the title for a book published in 1944. The perennial philosophy, according to Huxley, centers on the realization that there is more to us than just our physical bodies, with their genetic predispositions and environmental conditioning, and that life has meaning. According to this philosophy, every human being is a particularized expression of the universal, sacred reality that we each strive to embody and express a reality whose end knows no limits. The thrust of spiritual ethics is towards regarding all of creation as a family bound more by love than utility. This is a defining point in our history. With the advance of science and in particular technology, society is facing questions the answers to which could affect dramatically the direction of the next stage that evolution takes. These are not questions that can be dodged and will require much debate 
by the greatest minds in our world. Genetic engineering, according to its supporters, can increase the yield of food crops and eliminate or at least reduce in humans such widespread illnesses such as cancer and heart disease. Some might add they can't understand what all the fuss is about. In the Standard newspaper in London some years ago, we had the headline, Genetic Modification Has Been Practiced For Hundreds Of Years, As Everyone In The Field Knows. And while technology has given some credit for a lot of the labor-saving gadgetry we now take for granted, in the Western world, certain advances in medical science, such as the eradication of disease, owes much more to improve public sanitation and personal hygiene in the past century than advances described as vaccination and inoculation. Most people in this room were alive when thalidomide and birth control pills were first dispensed. The horrific defects manifest in newborn babies by pregnant women taking the former medication is well documented. But it's only relatively recently that the long-term dangers of those taking the contraceptive pill are becoming known. And while this talk originally was written in the context of spirituality and sports, I would like to share some gems of the inner life that have nothing to do with physical athletics. We use the word utopia in the title of this talk. Our friends at Google tell us the following about this term. Utopia is a word made up from the Greek OU, not, and topos, or place, and it roughly means no place and is used as a name for an imaginary society that is perfect or near perfect, unlike the societies we find in the real world. Utopias have characteristics such as peaceful government, equality for citizens, access to education, health care, employment, and so forth. The concept name was created by Sir Thomas More in 1516 as the title of his book Utopia. It was a, fish, a fictional description of an island that had the qualities of perfection. Now the fact he doesn't look very happy was perhaps he had to manage to understand that uh, his life to be was to be terminated soon because he got out on the wrong side of Henry VIII and it was curtains. But he'll be back, no doubt. In fact, this might be his reincarnation. I can't be sure. Hmm, similar clothing, yes. <laughs> As my wife used to say, well spotted, naughty. <laughs> the concept, right. An example of a society embracing utopian values was Noah, Nova Huta, which is a utopian socialist city in Poland on the outskirts of Krakow. Nova Huta is one of only two planned socialist realist settlements or districts that was ever built and one of the most renowned examples of deliberate social engineering in the entire world, created by the Russians at the end of World War II. Built as a utopian ideal city, its, streets, its street hierarchy, layout and certain grandeur of buildings often resembles Paris or London. The high abundance of parks and green areas in Nova Huta make it the greenest corner of Krakow. Most of the original utopias were created for religious purposes. Now I wonder, test time, do any of you in the audience know one in this country? A utopia? Hmm, a utopian village or town. Well, there was a place called New Harmony, Indiana that was uh, attempt to create some sort of a utopia. It was uh, uh, destroyed by virtue of the fact that they all had to be celibate and they died off <laughs> and, uh, and ended uh, New Harmony. <laughs> Interesting one. Thank you for that. Well, um, there, that wasn't on the list. Uh, have we got... You're very close, actually. Uh, um, it's, it's on the outskirts, actually. Uh, right, one of the earliest was devised by George Rapp, a German zealot who took 600 followers to western Pennsylvania in 1804. So, yes, okay. Well, and since on the topic of religion, the Garden of Eden is a utopia of a mankind that yearns for something only known to him through reverie. 
Although we must not forget that perhaps life is a dream. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Yes, that was what I put for the blurb for the summer school talk I gave on life, illusion, and reality. It was deemed to be inappropriate. So I decided to go to Google, my friend, and I typed in this, and I got some chap who was a dream psychologist, and he said, it's actually one of the most profound interpretations. Those nursery rhymes have a lot to tell the world, and not, well, to children of all ages, yes. Well, there we go. So the, the Garden of Eden, symbolic space of perfect harmony, the place in which absolute happiness reigns. And utopian settlements have been in the minds of theosophical leaders for a very long time. And there she is. Six months before her 80th birthday, in October 1927, Annie Besant, the irrepressible international president of our beloved Theosophical Society, announced an ambitious new project in the pages of the TS's premier monthly journal, The Theosophist. The Happy Valley Foundation has been established in the Ojai Valley, and 465 acres of the most beautiful part of the valley have been bought. In a prospectus dated the 11th of January, 1927, Besant declared the purpose of this purchase. We desire to form on this land a center which shall gradually grow into a miniature model of the new civilization, in which bodies, emotions, and minds shall be trained and disciplined in daily life into health, poise, and high intelligence. Fit dwellings for the divine life, developing the spirit of brotherhood practically in everyday arrangements and methods of living. The valley is about 80 miles north of Los Angeles, she wrote, and it has remained secluded since recent times and is still but sparsely populated. Besant called it the Happy Valley and hoped to create there a utopian community that would fulfill two aspects of the grand destiny of the TS as she saw it. One aspect of this destiny was to realize a statement attributed to a high spiritual being called the Maha Chohan, the Great Lord, received in a letter of 1882 by an early member of the TS in India. The Theosophical Society was chosen as the cornerstone, the foundation of the future religion of humanity. According to Besant, this future religion was to develop around the imminent appearance of a world teacher who was, at once, who was to be at once a new Buddha, a fresh incarnation of Vishnu and the second coming of Christ. Somehow this appearance would involve a protege of Mrs. Mrs. Besant, a charismatic young Indian man known as J. Krishnamurti. Now, I saw him speak at the Barbican in central London in 1986, months before he died, and I had a very long lens on my camera, and one of his supporters put their hand in front of it. <sighs> I'll have to wait till the next life. Yeah. The second aspect of Besant's vision to be fulfilled in the Happy Valley was to develop a new physiological and spiritual type of humanity that would eventually replace our current competitive mental-bound civilization with another based on cooperation and intuition. This new civilization would develop the principle of buddhi, a Sanskrit word which Besant defined as follows. The faculty above the ratiocinating mind, the pure reason, exercising the discriminative faculty of intuition, of spiritual discernment, According to Kurt Leyland in an article entitled Annie Besant, Philosopher King, he writes, Besant's pure compassionate reason entails the principle of unifying separate individualities into one and making them realize the spiritual unity which overshadows and underlies them all. For Besant, the inner purpose of the society was to prepare the world for the coming of a new race and itself to be the nucleus of that race. Hence, its focus on universal brotherhood, the only thing which is binding on members of the Theosophical Society. 
In a series given in London in June 1927, Besant stated, In what I have called the Happy Valley, we shall have a kind of miniature of the new civilization, which shall have economic socialism, practical brotherhood as its basis, added to that hierarchical form of government, which places the government in the hands of the wise. I'm not allowed to make political statements, but I'm sure you'd all agree we need more wisdom in our government, whether it's local or national or international, come to that. Thus, Besant's utopian project was to realize the goal implied in Plato's Republic. And I'm sure you've probably all read at some point, Blavatsky on many occasions said that most writers have only been, on the esoteric matters at least, have only been a footnote to this great man. Those Greeks do have a few tricks up their sleeve, don't they? I mean, so I like to say, in England, in English, the English language is absolutely swimming in Greek. I mean, how many children have asked their mother about a particular flower, whether they call it a mum or a chrysanthemum? People grew up thinking it's English. It's not English at all, it's Greek. And we haven't even changed the name. And the number of, my wife used to have problems with the, uh, what do you call that, sciatica. Well, I don't know if that's Greek or, or uh, Latin, but we've got so many wonderful medical terms. I say, oh, what an exotic sounding disease you've got. You know? <laughs> if you're going to have a disease, make it sound interesting. <laughs> Philosophy, again, Greek, medical terms, horticulture. I'm afraid economics, no. But you can't have everything, can you? <laughs> we'll give that to the Americans and the Brits, will we? Even a few Canadians, maybe. Thus, Besson's utopian project was to realize what Plato had set out, a government of the wise by highly trained guardians under the direction of a philosopher king. Besant did not live to see her blessed project come to fruition. However, during World War, World War II, Krishnamurti, Aldous Huxley, and others gathered in Ojai, California and incorporated Besant's educational aspects into the core philosophy of the Happy Valley School, now called the Besant Hill School of Happy Valley. A recent poll was taken of the public around the world to name countries that they would say practice utopian ideals. Well, we're back into the classroom now. Who do you think is in the top 10 according to this poll? Do we have some idea? Nepal. Interesting. Not, it might have been the 11th. It's not in the top 10. Right. Any more ideas? Correct. Anyone else? Any other countries come to mind? India. No. Finland. Finland, she said. Finland. And what's more, number one. Wow. Finland is number one. Ooh. Right. Switzerland. Correct. Number eight on the list. The U.S. is number nine. Okay, Norway. so we've got three out of ten. Norway. Norway. Norway's number five, yes. All right, so you've got four out of ten. Oh, we're on a roll. Keep going. Sweden. Sweden is uh, uh, number seven, yes, correct. Denmark. Denmark's number six, yes. <laughs> so they all appear to be. Keep going, keep going. How about Poland? No, but. but Australia. No. Oh. New Zealand. No. Canada. Correct. Canada's number four. Oh, you guys. So that's ahead of the U.S. That's five ahead of the U.S. Ooh. Oh, I know. Oh. Well, you, who, uh, who took this poll? <laughs> who do you think is not on the list? Russia. India. Well, India isn't. Russia isn't, yes. China. Correct. North Korea. No, well. <laughs> You'd have a better chance of winning the pools or the lottery. Than get. How about Japan? Japan is on the list, yes. Japan is number three. So you've now got Finland at one, Japan at three, Canada four, Norway five, Denmark six, Sweden seven, Switzerland eight, United States nine. You're only missing number two and number ten. No, we said no to them. All right. All right, I'll give you a hint. You uh, looked at Nordic countries. This is somebody you didn't mention. No, Nordic. No, Nordic. Iceland. Correct. Iceland is number two. Wow. And I don't think anyone would get number 10 somehow. Uh, Iceland is number 
two. Number two. Well, we don't say they didn't give me percentages. <laughs> Number ten is Singapore. Uh, yet Singapore, in some respects, has got one of the most narrow-minded, uh, uh, very heavy. Well, maybe you think it's a good idea if you get fined if you caught spitting, but it is quite authoritarian. But maybe they're talking about the, the, how good the pensions are. <laughs> you can buy most I'm, things. I'm curious where China would be on that list. Is China anywhere on that list? I only got the top 10, so I don't know who's in the top 50 or whatever. Okay. Anyway, the, maybe, the, maybe the country's paid to be put on the list. It's like, I'm sure it, <laughs> in the United States you have these compare sites for insurance or whatever. And then when you discover that they're not really objective at all, they're not independent. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. All right, I hope you enjoyed that diversion. Now we're back to the boring bits, but none of you are asleep, so that's a good sign yet. In Collected Writings, Volume 8, page 77, Blavatsky speaks about happiness and utopia, giving us the following. Happiness cannot exist where truth is absent, erected upon the shifting sands of human fiction and hypotheses. Happiness is merely a house of cards, tumbling down at the first whiff. It cannot exist in reality as long as egotism reigns supreme in civilized societies. As long as intellectual progress will refuse to accept a subordinate position to ethical progress and egotism will not give way to the altruism preached by Gautama and the true historical Jesus, the one of the pagan sanctuary, not the Christ of the churches, happiness for all the members of humanity will remain a utopia. We also read in Collected Writings, volume 13, page 302, the following about brotherhood and utopia. And she says, so then we postulate the idea of universal brotherhood. We wish it to be understood it is held in no utopian sense. Though we do not dream of realizing it at once on the ordinary plane of social or national relations. Most assuredly, if this view of the kinship of all mankind could gain universal acceptance, the approved sense of moral responsibility it would engender would cause most social evils and international asperities to disappear for a true altruism instead of the present egoism would be the rule the world over. And as to altruism itself and membership in this organization, and more to the point, what it means to be a theosophist, in Collected Writings 8, Blavatsky says the following, He who does not practice altruism, he who is not prepared to share his lost morsel with the weaker or poorer than himself, he who neglects to help his fellow man of whatever race, nation, or creed, whenever or wherever he meets suffering and turns a deaf ear to the cry of human misery, he who hears an innocent person slandered, whether a brother theosophist or not, and does not undertake his defense as he would undertake his own, is no theosophist. Gautama the Buddha, we are told, remained in solitude long enough for him to arrive at the truth to the propagation of which he devoted himself from that time on begging his bread and living for humanity. The idea is that these great teachers do not feel the need to hide in caves. And we have several examples of this in the modern world of just that. I cite the example of Mother Teresa, with whom I should think most of you were familiar. She died earlier in this century, and the service she gave to India, working amongst lepers. As an example of a person whose heart was in the right place, she never caught the disease with which she was dealing. We have the nuns working in London, and again not a cloistered existence, based as they are on the edge of Hyde Park, just around the corner from Marble Arch and the T.S. in England's headquarters. They work amongst prostitutes in the red light district of Soho. And many of you recall this lovely lady who actually was born on Canada Day in 1960. And her work with AIDS victims. Now, these are just a few examples I pulled out of the hat. 
These are not people who have to give in this way simply for publicity. One of the royals, much more current, is her son Prince Harry, who has set up the Invictus Games, which brings us back to the Olympics in a sense. These games use the power of sport to inspire recovery amongst disabled soldiers. Then closer to home in a spiritual sense, there's the Theosophical Order of Service, which is very active in helping wherever disasters strike all around the world. In Britain, they have a very successful initiative called Teddies for Tragedies, because it's been shown that children in hospitals recover much more quickly if they have a teddy to play with. We have many examples of people who every day are giving beyond the norm, who are simply opening their pockets if they have money and making a difference in society, going about it quietly and not accepting any sort of thanks. There are people who endow the arts in the United States and Britain, making it possible for cultural institutions to open their doors to the public for little or no charge. Others are anonymously helping the poor in both the developed and third world, providing funds for much needed food, medicine and shelter. Another strand to consider in this talk has to do with the underlying concept of conflict and duality. The Russian writer Alexander Solyanitsyn has a famous quote on which we should all ponder regularly. There will not be peace in the world as long as man is at war with himself. Ponder on that, I say. We have this battle in ourselves, and the challenge is to balance our higher and lower nature, which might be compared to two sides of the same coin. As the oracle at Delphi in ancient Greece would have it, the goal is to know thyself. This internal battle is one which I should imagine each and every one of us has been fighting since the day we were born. It manifests in a myriad of ways, and no two persons have identical challenges. But it's no good acting like an ostrich, because if one does not learn a particular lesson in this life, as day follows night and night follows day, you can be sure that that unfinished lesson will greet you upon your return in the next life. We belong to an organization whose main raison d'etre is to create a universal brotherhood and sisterhood. But we should not forget that we are not the only show in town and should, where possible, network with other groups doing similar altruistic work. In the spirit of remarks made earlier about the genome sequencing was the discovery recently of only a few DNA strands separating the human from the ape at a physical level. More startling was the observation of a relatively small number, perhaps a hundred or even a thousand, differentiating us and a single-celled amoeba as Blavatsky regularly remarked, unity is a fact of nature. And modern science has merely confirmed what the ageless wisdom spoke of down the millennia and expressed in a multitude of ways. The concept of a universe, sorry, the concept of a unitary existence seems to be playing out more and more in the modern world. Several ecological and even economic movements have been seeded, and ordinary people are now protesting mostly peaceably on behalf of endangered species of plants and animals and as well on behalf of disadvantaged people suffering at the hands of tyrannical regimes. There seems to be a growing understanding at gut level amongst the young of shared goals and responsibilities for the planet and all its occupants. While it might be easy to get drawn into taking sides on apparent injustices in our own or other countries, Perhaps it might be best to try and rise above any dualistic position and practice what the Buddha described as the middle way. This is where meditation comes into sharp focus as a practice that, when in touch at a deeper level, helps us to focus and become of real assistance to our fellow man. Change yourself and you can change the world. How often did our co-founder, HPB, remark that the real problem of the world is not material, but rather spiritual poverty. One should never underestimate the effect we have on others, or as HPB would describe it, the power of thought, and if used positively, to make the world a better place. 
There must have been something that drew you to attend Theosophical meetings or join the Society recently or, as the case might be, several years ago. Perhaps the impetus came in a previous life, and only in this life did you have the inclination and the time to make it all happen. I was one of the fortunate ones to actually carve a career out of working as a publicist for the Theosophical Society in England for some 37 years. It has been a privilege to work for the Society and hopefully I can continue to help spread the word. Shall we all do what we can in whatever way we can to spread knowledge of the eternal verities of the ageless wisdom, to make it known that such a thing as theosophy exists? It's the medicine the world has been crying out for. Thank you for your attention. And why don't we just end reading these words and maybe have five minutes silence? If I close my eyes, I can't read it. Read it and then close your eyes. <laughs> Thank you. Let me just get a good shot of you all. All these smiling faces. Thank you. Very good. Very good indeed. <sighs> well, I suppose you'd like to, do any of you have questions you'd like to ask? Yes. Well, I, I wrote it first of all in 2012, and then because both the tape, well, the, the transcript was lost, I had to transcribe it from a tape, so it became fresher, and then I, I went, but yes, I originally did something on genetic engineering, and then I married the two together. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been brewing for a while, yes. <laughs> Well, I, I, I try to, as I said at the tail end, it's, it's easy to get drawn into a position of duality. Um, there was a program in Britain about 10 years ago called One, One Earth, and they, Prince Charles, as you'd probably know, is very keen on the environment. Uh, and as he's an American, perhaps a number of you know that Robert Redford is also keen very much, and he was one of those interviewed. And, Redford used to think that petrochemical executives were the devil incarnate until he met one one day, a vice president. And you know, he had only two eyes, two legs, two arms, two kids. I don't think he had two wives. And uh, you know, he was a normal sort of Joe who couldn't just do anything he wanted. He had to work through a, a team. And it was after that revelation by, uh, by Robert Redford that this chap you know, he's not really not much different from me or anyone else. We have a lot more in common that separates us. And he thought, instead of looking at this man as part of the problem, he saw him as part of the potential solution. So it's easy to, to badmouth uh, companies by name or individuals in companies. But 
I think it's much better to shine a light in their direction because a lot of people are happily bumping along through life who only think this is what, as Peggy Lee used to say, is that all there is? That a material life, wine, women, a song, sorry that sounds very sexist, is a lot of what many men would think is the only, the only reality. And then if someone very close to them dies or gets ill, they're forced to reassess the value and meaning of life. And that's when things like this, this idea that we're all part of a web, comes home. And, you know, the day that we really can feel it in our blood that every man is our brother and every woman's our sister. I mean, we don't need religion to tell us about people ascending. You know, the kingdom of God is within. And w when I hear people say, oh, they're searching for God, Look outside, the beauty of nature, or even in Detroit, the beauty of your buildings, you know. There's beauty everywhere. Just open your damn eyes and you might see it, you know. And we've had so, well, I wouldn't want to live at any other time in life. I mean, we can now, I, I'm a bit retro, I have vinyl records. I never got rid of a lot. I used to be a disc jockey in the 60s, 70s in Canada. And I now get them from the charity shop for the less than an American dollar. I mean, I say, you're not charging enough. You know? But, and most of them are good condition, so I bought a new turntable and speakers. As soon as I got the speakers, I could hear how bad the records were. But that's, that's life. But the thing is that, you know, one door closes, another opens. When, when radio came along, it wasn't the death of newspapers. It was simply musical chairs. Similarly, when television came on, it wasn't the death of radio. And the internet, again, hasn't killed other things. It's just people, a lot of situations, are, people need to find niche positions. But there's, there's enough room for everyone and everything. And I would think we'd be terribly boring if we were all the same. The French have an expression, vive la différence. I celebrate diversity. You know, that uh, without sounding possibly paternalistic, when Martin Luther King, who was a saint to many people, not just to his own black community, he had a wonderful expression. It's not the color of your skin that counts, it's the color of your heart. And I hope it's gold, boy. And I mean, that really drives home the whole point, because this, this lecture tonight was really about finding spiritual gold. And it's not outside, and it's not material. Or somebody likes to say there's no banks in heaven, you know. You have to make every day pay, you know. And uh, the number of people in, in Britain who used to work for the railway company when it was nationalized, they didn't get paid well enough to live on 40 hours, so they tended to work 60 hours a week. They had a wonderful pension scheme, and guess how many of them ever collected it? Because, you know, over a period of time, you simply, the body can't take it. But, you know, don't put off to tomorrow what you should do today. You know, try and live a little bit every day, you know. And I was discussing this with my, my new made friend, David, you know, that this idea that there's, you know, the, the whole concept of work, both he and me, because I, I had a creative job as well as publicist. I used to be able to take photographs and manage to slap pictures of flowers on the cover of, of magazines and stuff. I was getting paid to do the job. I mean, the number of people in the, in the theosophical world that get paid, you know, I didn't get overpaid. I had to do two jobs for a while to make ends meet. But, you know, it was a privilege. And I, maybe that was good karma, you know. People only seem to hear about bad karma. They don't seem to think there might actually be good karma, you know. Maybe, maybe as my wife used to say, it's your cup half empty or half full. You know, and as, as my girlfriend now, because I lost my wife 10 years ago, my girlfriend often says, you're an M.O.B., a miserable old bollocks, you know. <laughs> and this is it. It's, it's, it may, perhaps it's a male thing. But, you know, there's also something called divine indignation, that you're, you're unhappy. If you're unhappy because you're worried about the, the way the world is going, maybe that's a positive <coughs> thing. But only if, if it sits there, if it moves down to here and you do something about it. That's what it's all about, you know. But... I, I consider myself very fortunate. I'm, I'm 68 and a half years of age. If I dropped dead tomorrow, I wouldn't say my life was a waste of time. Uh, I would like to think that the Theosophical Society was far more successful in a pragmatic way. But how do you measure, how do you measure spiritual success? 
you know, if you have lit a light in someone's life, that whether they join or stay or never join, does it really matter if they've actually been touched by these eternal verities? You know, because I worked in statistics and I, I was the membership secretary, to see the numbers go down, you know, it didn't fill me with joy, but I was too attached to outside situations. I mean, Blavatsky herself often would say we should not be attached to the fruits of our efforts. You do the best you can and then shut up and go to sleep. <laughs> At least I'm talking about myself. I don't know. I'm, now I'm rambling. <laughs> One. Yes. Yeah. Start start from where you are. Yeah. You can't change the world until you change yourself. You know. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, you know, one more. Question, or yeah. Comment. I don't know. Uh, okay. So our Theosophical Society is, has a, a altruistic point of view to yes. let uh, beings be. Hmm. But isn't GMO kind of a contradiction to what, uh, you know, you're trying to alter beings? I know. So uh, there's a conflict to me right there. Well, I personally, because one of the, the ladies at the back asked how I feel, I personally would try and avoid buying it. And, and fortunately, touch wood in Britain, we haven't caved in yet. But I'll tell you this pressure at, at, at the highest positions of government to try and let GM uh, technology get, get a foothold. Wasn't that sort of like uh, globalism as opposed to yeah. utopianism? I would, I would agree there's with you. A, there's a difference. I there mean, is. Too extreme. I, I wouldn't have ventilated the subject if, if I thought it was a healthy situation. <laughs> okay. The question is, how do we go about it? How do we appeal to these people? Do we take Robert Redford's approach that bring them on board? Because I, uh, we saw some, uh, picket, some pickets outside General Motors earlier today. Uh, the Germans have strong unions, uh, IG Metal, I think is what it's called, but they actually have representatives on management. And because the, the Germans take a very pragmatic view on this, well, if you can't beat them, eat them. No, uh, <laughs> the, the thing is, Rather than look for conflict, let's find a way to work together. So they get, and, and that makes the people in, in the unions feel valued, which is what it's supposed to be. In Japan, you have a situation, the canteen, from the part-time cleaner to the highest uh, CEO, they all sit down in the same canteen together. I wish I could say that in Britain. It happens, but it's not happening enough, or not quickly enough. But you see, if you make people feel involved, they well, um, our friend here, without embarrassing him, he worked for GM, and it was quite a very inclusive culture. That should be a model, and it should be the default. It shouldn't be the exception to the rule. I mean, the humans are extremely adaptable. You know, I, you know, I just some people are, are are seduced by the material world. Well, a lot are seduced. You know, at, at times if I speak to an audience like this. I feel I'm speaking to the converted. It's them out there that need to hear the message, but do they want to hear the message? As I say, it's a circumstance in their life, an illness or something, that is often the first time they start to look within and, and reevaluate the value of life. I mean, my wife died in 20 hours 10 years ago, and all of the things I should have said and a lot I shouldn't have said. I mean, I, I was in a coma, at least metaphorically, for three months. I expected she'd come back, and she didn't. And then, fortunately, I had a, a, a girlfriend. I cried on her shoulder for a year. I'm a chatterbox, or hadn't you noticed? So I just used anyone I meet at a train station on a bus, and I just opened my heart. And you know, the interesting thing is, when my wife died, I got 90 sympathy cards, even more than we got Christmas cards then. But about a third of them had a personal message. And when I was chatting to people afterwards, people who I'd known just in a general sense, came out of the woodwork, as it were, and said, oh, yes, my husband and I went on holidays. We're in the hotel room after a good day out. Just dropped dead like that, you know. Not being able to say goodbye properly. I mean, that is that hurts, you know. But this great philosophy is what kept me uh, afloat. I mean, we all know we're on the same journey, and it's just a question of us maybe traveling at a different speed. 
But the, the whole concept that this is not your only life. I mean, I know they say, the critics, you can't prove reincarnation, but you can't disprove it either. And too many intelligent people, right across the whole spectrum of life, have taken on board, including Mr. Detroit himself, Henry Ford. I didn't know, but uh, David tells me he was a member of your great lodge, you know. I think that I think all the publicity sheets, because we like to name drop, don't we? we had Piet Mondry and the, the great mystical painter. I mean, uh, Britain's had some big guns as well. Einstein. Well, he was he didn't join, but he had a copy of the SD in his his book. But Abner Doubleday, Mr. Baseball, and in Canada, the the uh, the son of Mr. Ice uh, of Co uh, Albert Smythe, who started the Toronto Lodge, that was the first branch. He actually met W. Q. Judge on a boat coming from Liverpool. <laughs> Synchronicity or not? We've got all these big guns, you know, across the board. And well, as publicist, I always feel we should drive home this thing. My, I, I think I lost my first Italian girlfriend because I was considered a zealot. I mean. When you've got theosophy in your blood, what are you supposed to do? Take it easy, you know? If the membership was soaring, then I would feel, oh, I could sort of take my foot off the accelerator. Anyway, I think I've, don't you think you've heard enough from me for one night? You're going to be punished tomorrow morning if you actually want to come back. <laughs> What's the discussion tomorrow? Annie Besant. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I see you. <laughs> Can I get a ride? <laughs> He's my ride, so I got to check with the oh, chauffeur. Right. Check with the chauffeur, well, that's a good one. <laughs> okay, well, thanks a lot, Colin. It was uh, a, a real pleasure and a very well uh, done lecture. I want to thank you on behalf of the membership and the board. Pleasure. <laughs>